Hello everyone and welcome to the first Scots Way podcast of the new year and I'm delighted to be joined by writer David Ross. Hello David. How you doing? How you doing Arsenal? Good to see you. And Good to see you. anybody, let's be yeah. honest. <laughs> I think during this year I'm going to use these as an excuse to catch up with folk. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean I, I I sometimes kind of get the feeling that um, whilst it's great, you know, and and it's great to see people that particularly, you know, I don't I don't actually remember the last time you know you and I met and in, uh, in, in person. It's a, it's been a while. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, there's that, that, that other element of I think the the, the whole Zoom and Teams and Zencast or whatever. I, I I do think people are probably getting you know getting a wee bit for work anyway. Yeah. Our, our people are really pretty tired of it I think you know it's this but it's here to stay I think you know um, yeah. I think you have to make the most of it and at least you know uh, you guys are putting out uh, content and culture and it's connecting with people at the moment and I think that's really valuable. I think the last time we would have seen each other in person would have been the event at the uh, Dick Institute at the library. That's right. Uh, it was a great right. night and that those kind of nights are what I'm really before we got on to talk about the book, which is why those are the kind of nights I'm really missing is that whole thing of people all being together and reading from books or reading their poetry or playing music or whatever it is. Yeah, That's yeah. really, I didn't realise it would hit me as hard as it has, but it has. Oh, definitely. I mean, that that that's without doubt the thing I've missed the most. Just, um, and, and probably because um, I, I was starting to do more of those kind of things. You know, um, I don't. You know, the, the no no harm to the the in the in bookshop launch or anything like that, where you're kind of reading and talking and stuff like that. But I think when you can sort of make an event of it or a night of it, and I just I kind of noticed that there was probably a lot more of those things happening. Um, and you know, maybe maybe it's maybe it's more the people I'm drawn to that see the connection between different elements of culture and even wee bits of film and things like that, yeah. you know? Um, and I thought that was, if, if this is the, you know, late 2019, if this is where we're going with a lot of this and they can happen in a relatively short pop-up type environment, I think that's yeah. brilliant. You know, that that's just, that's it for me, you know? Um, and then all of a sudden this happened. And, you know, with a bit of luck, we'll, we'll, get back to that um, kind of cross fertilization between different elements of yeah. literature and culture and film and music because that, that, that I thought that was great. Yeah, they were great, great nights. Um, well, we're here to talk about your latest novel, There's Only One Danny Garvey, which I've got a copy here for people watching the video version. And well, let's kick off with a fairly obvious question. Who is Danny Garvey? Is Danny Garvey, and is there only one Danny Garvey? Is there That's only the, one? That question through the book. Um, I, I was kind of, I'm trying to think of the the origins of this book, and it and it probably goes back to before I actually had even considered writing anything. Really, I know that sounds a bit uh, perverse, but um, I, I tell you a story, um, and it stuck with me for a long time. Um, maybe about. Oh, how long would it be? 15 years ago or so. I I was working down in Leeds a lot. Uh, we had a fairly big project there that required me to be there fairly regularly. And um, I think I was going through um, a bit of a dark time personally. Then I was on my own. I was in the Queen's Hotel. Um, and I had, um, I'm fairly sure I had, at this point, I had read David Peace's book, The Damned United. Yeah. Um, which is about um, Brian Clark. I mean, it's a, I, I, I guess it's a, a, a sort of fictionalised version of Brian Clough's 44 days as manager of Leeds United. And a lot of it takes place in the Queen's Hotel. And it's an unusual kind of structure uh, right, in the, right in the middle, but it's, it's in the middle of the city. Um, it's got this kind of old almost like the shining feel to um, the corridors and the rooms and all the rest of it. Um, and when I was there, it was midweek and there didn't seem to be anybody in the hotel ever, you know, yet there were, and the reason I know that is because I think three three nights, uh, and there were three consecutive nights, the fire alarm went off at three in the morning and everybody was brought outside and there was only 
maybe about five or six guests. So it's right. the same five or six every night, you know. Um, so go back in and I mulled this over. And when I, when I went home, um, because I felt, you know, there was things in the, the Damned United that I remembered, you know, about the hotel almost the, contributing to the isolation that Brian Clough felt. And he started to question his own ability and his own, you know, the whole thing. Um, and that stuck with me a lot, you know. And then when we when I went away overseas and I was writing to start writing, the, there was a lot of that kind of thought about how people are isolated from things that they would connect with, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's probably a theme and that runs through quite a lot of the writing, particularly as I've maybe got a wee bit more confident in writing. So this time, from the very beginning, um, I wanted to write about um, trauma and isolation, and it was think it was really thinking back to how I felt at that time, you know, okay. and putting the two together, you know, remembering about um, connecting so much with the Brian Clough story and David Peace's book, which I think's amazing. Um, you know, I thought that's an interesting idea to talk about someone's trauma and you know the the sort of feelings that they have where they feel right on the outside of everything. But they have to somehow put that to one side on a weekly basis and perform either as a football player or as a manager or something, you know. And that kind of duality of being able to kind of compartmentalise or, or not those feelings in order to be able to be involved in a fairly male-dominated environment where that kind of mental weakness isn't really taken mm -hmm. seriously, uh, you know, I, I thought was quite an interesting way to look at football as a background to a story. So Danny really was the vehicle to tell that story, to be honest. You know? Right. So that's interesting because the kind of time he would be isolated and maybe staying in hotels or at least away from his family isn't really in the yeah. book, is it? It's kind of referred to. But when he's young, no, no, no. He's kind I, of young I, football I mean, to Aberdeen, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he, got, he, he goes to Aberdeen um, and he's only really there for a season and a half, you know. Um, I mean, I know that there's, that bit of the book is kind of background sketchy in terms of its outline, but essentially his, li his life as a potential professional footballer lasted 18 months, right. um, bad injury, and then drifts out. But I think uh, knowing that, there, I, I think the injury had to be uh, part of his downfall, you know, and, and, in terms of a, to take him into a different place. Sure. And I think once that happened um he's really got to come back you know he's, he's got to come back to um what most people i mean he's he's reluctant to call it home but yeah. he's got to come back to the village that he grew up in and it's a small village and there's only one road into it and it, it will feel claustrophobic to him and i think that's the context he had to really be in for a lot of this to come out you know i think if he'd stayed at aberdeen and you know whether it whether he'd been a success there or whether it had just basically been a kind of middle of the road professional career, then, you know, some, something had to shock him into, into um, conf either confronting these feelings that he had or, you know, addressing it in a different way. Because it's, for me, a lot of it's about the difficulty of going home, particularly when you've almost had, this, this is a Barshaw is the name of the village, and yeah. um, the, the community has been hit by unemployment and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and, and that difficulty in coming home when you have been almost the one that's got away, you know, yeah. struck me in the book, you know, he comes back and all the different feelings that provokes in the other people there. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I was really, you know, when you, when you look at the statistics um, and the opportunities to make it big in football now, particularly if you come from Scotland, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're, most people, I, I certainly had it, I, I, maybe you had it as well, most people when they're young will have that dream, you know, e even though at, while they're having it, they'll probably appreciate um, how unlikely it's going to be to happen, they still have it, you know, nothing stops yeah. that from moving away, you know, um, and I think, you know, the, the reality of that situation, regardless of how good you are as a, as a young football player, um, that being the, like, the most likely outcome, I think I, I, was, I was interested in, you know, when you're taking someone who's, who's potentially damaged anyway, you yeah. know, and you put them into that fairly crushing 
scenario. You know, it, it was almost an interest in seeing how he responds and how he copes and, you know, can you keep those feelings buried forever, you know? And I don't think you can. I mean, I think I think there's an inevitability that, um, you know, they're, they're, his true self will, will emerge, which is probably why, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's a question behind that chant at the beginning of there's only one Danny Garvey. I think um, there's, it, it depends on who you want him to see at any given, or who, who he wants you to see at yeah. any given time, you know. Um, so when he comes comes back, he uh, manages the local team again. This game, so he really does kind of throw himself. It feels like he goes home because there's nowhere else to go, and he does that yeah. because there's kind of nothing else that he can yeah. do, isn't it? I mean, he's almost got to to uh, uh, take what's offered. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a few hints. I think that um, when when he's been with the the youth club in Arbroath, whilst he's been successful on the pitch, there's 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 a couple of hints that um, the club are either worried about his mental state, or there's been a couple of instances that it's referred to. Um, I don't think I'm giving too much away here by if anybody hasn't read it, but there's incidents referred to in a library, you know, yeah. where um, he's defacing and, and uh, you know, pulling pages out of things and taping them back into other, taping the endings of certain uh, books into, into other ones. And he justifies that um, by, by he self justifies that in his narrative by saying, well, if nobody knows the end of Anne Frank, then fuck them, they shouldn't have been a library anyway, you know. Um, so there's, there's that kind of, uh, there's always that thing that he knows potentially what he's doing isn't right, but, you know, there's a justification as to why he's doing it. And if nobody, if, if people complain about that, then they just don't understand what he's, you know. Um, but I think there's there's a whole host of voices going on around him and in his head and driving him. But, you know, the, the one thing he does know how to do is um, coach a performance out of uh, particularly young players, young football players, that when the team are looking for a manager, maybe a light bulb goes on over his head and he thinks, this is the way I can get him back, you know, because he'll be doing something that he knows. They know him. I think Higgy's kind of trying to always look out for him, you know, and, and hope that this is a thing that will finally set him on the right track, you know. You mentioned Higgy there, and some of the characters are really memorable, you know. So I'd maybe like to talk about a few of them if possible. Yeah. Higgy and Raymond are kind of they're, they're as close as he's got to family, really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, Higgy, uh, I think Higgy's. I, I need to be careful here. Uh, uh, Higgy is uh, named after uh, one of my uh, sons. Uh, managers and coaches right. at Bonnet and Football Club, um, okay. and that's all. I mean, I, the, the the weird thing is, I don't I don't actually know him. I just I thought you know there's there's some wee uh, nods to people um, who I have either known in amateur football or junior football or whatever, um, and I just thought it would be nice. It's not you know he, he knows this the real Higgy knows that this Higgy isn't him, but. It's just his name, and I quite like the name anyway. But Higgy um, is uh, a guy who has grown up um, devoted and in love with uh, Danny and Raymond's mum, you yeah. know, uh, despite knowing that, probably knowing deep down that none's ever going to come of it. Um, and in that sense, he's probably the closest thing the two of them have to a father, mm -hmm. particularly Danny, I think. Raymond's always... Uh, be perceived to be maybe a bit more independent of spirit, if um, if not anything else. Um, so Higgy is uh, obsessed with the local football team. His his grandfather uh, worked there. Um, he devotes all his time to you know, and I I think Higgy's kind of representative of a number of people I've come across who will selflessly commit themselves to. Um, a junior football club or an amateur football club, really without much thanks, to be honest. You know, they're only getting paid for it. Um, they give up their weekends. They, you know, um, maybe it's maybe it's about passion. Maybe it's about habit. Maybe it's just 
something about that um, that I find really interesting. I mean, you know, I know you talk about the grassroots of football a lot, but without people like Higgy and the real life versions of them, you know, that level of football just wouldn't take place, you know. Um, and I was always interested in that, you know, and, and my son's got a bit of that, I have to be honest. I mean, he's extremely dedicated to it um, in a way that, you know, I sometimes wish he would, it could be dedicated to other things, <laughs> um, do you know, but he'll think nothing, you know, Nathan would just come home and, uh, you know, you'd get a phone call, uh, he'd been working all day and you'd get a phone call, he'd come home for dinner, no, I'm driving to the bonnet and a plane uh, in uh, the other side of Edinburgh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he'd be away from six in the morning till probably close to midnight at night and then having to go to work the next day as well. And he'll rain or shine, you know, not getting paid for it, driving people around, balls in the car, you know, his, his mum, you know, the, the uh, laundry going like a, <laughs> the washing machine going like a fair down the stairs. Um, and I, Higgy, uh, I think, is probably the soul of the club, you know. Yeah. I think um, that's really interesting, that level of uh, participation and perhaps obsession. You know, it's it's quite easy to follow, you know, the big teams where you, everything's winning and all, yeah. but that kind of, yeah. um, we've all done them, you know, at a le level where, you know, you're playing in this sometimes stinging rain and, you know, uh, yeah. your showers are cold and all that kind of stuff. To go back again and again, that's yeah, again. It's so interesting that that's the thing. Because I get I got to a stage with football that it was like, right, I've kind of done my bit now, you know, that's fine. And you you want a warm shower, basically. Aye. Uh, okay. Folk that keep doing it, it's uh, it's admirable, definitely. I, th I mean, th this is, this book's really for them, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I hope, I don't know, there's, there's I, I knew from the beginning there's there's a fine line to be walked when you when you write something that's got football at its core, um, because, um, you know, does everybody then assume that if you're in, you can only really like the book if you're interested in football, um, and worse than that, does it then become a football book, you know, um, and I, I, I think the you know, to go back to the Damned United or even uh, the, the books that have really influenced us um, are that book, The Damned United. There's a, there's a great book by Ross Raisin called The Natural, right. um, which is about a young 19-year-old player in England. Um, and, it, you know, the purpose of that is it's tackling uh, homophobia in, in football. Um, young guys repressed and, I think, doesn't realise he's gay at the beginning of the book, you know, and this is a young boy that's been tipped for uh, playing for England, you know, but then gets loaned out, there's something in his mindset that's not, uh, he's not really part of the pack, you know, um, and he starts to slide down the divisions through, and it's that kind of re, kind of realisation that, um, you know, he's not really one of, you know, he's a, he's a I, think, I think the phrase is the natural, um, he's a natural with a ball at his feet, but not a natural footballer, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and that was a real influence on Danny Garvey as well. And I'm looking at books that I think are, you know, they've, they've, they've got football as the backbone um, and things are played out against the game, but they're not football books, you know. Yeah. And some of, these, some of these books are, in my opinion, the best writing about anything, mm. you know, I've just you know, and even even to go more to the the, the factual side, I mean Hugh McIlvanny writing about football is William McIlvanny writing about crime. It's yeah. it's it's at the same level, you know. Um, and I, I you know I, I I kind of thought that's the ambition that I had for the book that it would be of interest to people who weren't. Um, really all that interest in football, maybe understood a wee bit about it, but could maybe see that there's the chaotic nature of what goes on in his brain and his family life on the one hand, and he's got to try and think about um, repetition and, you know, tactics and all these other things. And then the third element was, you know, realising that a lot of people who are, who are great at football, and I'm talking about great on a world level, mm -hmm. are... T to some extent on the autistic spectrum because you know that that determination 
um, to go out and train repeatedly or, you know, when, I, when other people would just think, I've had enough of this, you know, yeah. there's that kind of metronomic element of, so, you know, there's, there's that aspect and Danny begins to identify with that. Yeah. Uh, and you get, a, you know, through that identification, you get a wee bit of an insight into more of an insight into him, you know. Yeah, it's interesting now the kind of people that are drawn to sport think of, I think Daley Thompson said he used to train on Christmas Day because he knew he, none yeah. of his rivals were training on Christmas Day. So that kind of desire to be. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So because it is set, we haven't mentioned, but it is set to the backdrop of Scottish junior football. Yes. Which is a right uh, place for uh, fiction anyway. You know, some of the stuff, some of the real stuff is what is bizarre enough. So uh, is, it, is it a thing you knew well? Did you know that kind of Scottish junior? Um, well? Yeah, I, I, I played at amateur level. I, did, I, didn't, I wasn't good enough to play junior level, but um, I did play a lot in the uh, Ayrshire areas. And, you know, I, um, there's a lot of humour to be found in, in that context and that and Vamia's mean, probably a lot of humor in, in football generally in my opinion but um I mean some of the things that I'd witnessed or seen you know um that have always stayed with me and I know and I know and I like this actually about football I know that in the telling you know most people add something else to them and they they grow and I love that about football I love the ridiculousness of football but there was there was um I remember one time there's a couple of events that didn't make it in the book because I thought they were too ridiculous. But yeah. I remember uh, playing, I can't remember who they were playing, who I was playing for at the time, but down in uh, Catron or Cotron, um, as you used to call it, um, we went down on a Sunday and, uh, you know, normally you go to these games and there would be a few people hanging about, maybe with a dog, you know, on the sidelines. So the first thing was the linesman, the, the two linesmen hadn't turned up just a ref, um, and had said to everybody, I don't really want to know, yeah, everybody's here, so yeah. why don't we just have a game? If somebody runs the lines on either side, that's fine. One from the home team, one from the away team. Um, so we, we come out, and by the time we're out, I'm at, there's just like a massive crowd is <laughs> for an amateur game. Do you know what I mean? It's oh, weird. Man. But the people lining the, lining the sides on either sides um, are all... Home fans, they're all they're all there for you know. Most of them are drunk. There, there must have been about uh, a ratio of one Alsatian for every two people, <laughs> and they're all on the sidelines, you know. And it was just you could tell this is going to be a riot from the beginning, you know. People throwing things onto the pitch, and you know, one of the guys we were with get um, <laughs> hit in the. This is the first time I've ever seen anybody having to go off with this injury. He got hit in the face with a pie. And the pie was obviously just brand new bought, you know, and the filling burst and the this burning hot grease running down this guy's face, you know, and had to go off, had to go off for five minutes to get us treated. Um, and we were like, nobody wanted to play on the wings, you know. We, we must have had a, a, a formation of about two, 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 you know. And I'm just thinking, this is mental, you know, it's just absolutely crazy. And the other one, I, I had, uh, I got knocked unconscious in a game in Muirhead, uh, and it was a cup game, and I woke up in a taxi on the way home. Uh, so nobody, nobody wanted to come with me, you know, <laughs> and make sure I was okay. Back in the days before, you know, there was all this issue with concussion, somebody just phoned a taxi, uh, stuck me in it, and I was on the way to Marnock. On, I, I, and I woke up in the taxi, uh, and the guy said to me, you all right there, son, you okay? And I said, I think so. I thought I was getting kidnapped. And he, he just he told me what had happened, and he said, where am I taking you? And I, I couldn't remember my address, you know? Um, I just were driving around to Marnock with me trying to see if there was anything that I could remember and, and find, you know. And I, of course, I go, oh, my mum went mental. You know, she was a nurse at the hospital. So straight out to Cross House Hospital, you know. Um, so the, I, I, I found myself um, gathering stories like yeah. that. Um, and then I met uh, Alan Ruff, because uh, oh, yeah. Alan was a manager uh -huh. uh, of 
the Glens in the mid nineties, early mid nineties. Um, so I went to see him a couple of times, mainly just to ask some background detail. I didn't. I didn't. It was one of those things where I didn't really want him to tell me stories because yeah. I thought, I, you know, what do I do with that? If, so I just wanted him to tell me, like, what did a manager get? How much did he get paid? What was the? How did you go about getting? But he, he couldn't help himself. He told me all these amazing stories. <laughs> but um, there's there's a couple of them. I've tailored a couple of them in the book there. But it's so interesting. No, I mean, it, was, it, was just, it, was, it was a great. Um, I just thought this is I, again, you know, and, and you were kind enough to say it um, and the review of it, it. It was trying to make sure the balance between what's I wanted to write something that was a bit more serious for, from my perspective, but not lose a wee bit of that light and shade that, you know, I think you need to make to, to make the book really resonate with people, you know? No, oh, absolutely. And if, I think if, if you'd filled it with tales, it would have been entertaining, but it would certainly have taken away, I think, from Aye. Danny's story, which you uh, explained earlier on. And you've also got the characters of Nancy and Demo. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about their role in the book. Well, I, I think Danny's um, reluctance um, to, to even come back, to, it feels as if he's been dragged back yeah, yeah. to Barstow in some respects. But I think Nancy, uh, Nancy's important for him to feel like, actually, maybe this isn't the worst thing in the world. You know, um, no, there's a bit of a connection there. And I don't know whether... Um, I haven't really thought about this much, but I don't know whether it's deliberate on his part to get back at Raymond or whether there's a connection that he sees with Nancy and makes him think, um, you know, there's a life beyond the one that I've been living that actually I think might be a lot more rewarding. But either way, it, it gets in his head that there's an atonement for things that he's maybe been, in, in, his, in brief moments of honesty, I think he feels that there's things that he has to atone for. Yeah. And it's only by atoning that he sees that he could potentially have a future with her. Mm -hmm. You know, so she becomes the kind of focus of, well, that's that's the redemption I'm looking for, and that's the life I want to have. And you know, he's constantly looking at the boy and thinking, I understand him more than anybody else, you know. Um, and he sees that future with them. But there's, there's a feeling that, you know, in, in order to have earned the right to be with her, he has to atone for other things. Yeah. And he has to know um, how he's done that, you know. Um, and, that, you know, I, I think when we're getting to that part of the book, that's where it becomes, a you know, for Danny anyway, it becomes a lot more confusing. Yeah, um, and, you know, you were mentioning more than, more than one Danny Garvey. I felt you had... At times, and we were all a bit like this, but at times he could see no hope. And then yeah. other times he's suddenly got a little glimpse of something that's a possibility uh, yeah. that could kind of change things for him. And also putting it in a small village, if you live in a city, then that it maybe wouldn't be noted. People maybe wouldn't know. But to do it all, it's all very compressed, isn't it? When yeah. everyone knows your name and everyone knows where you live and all of that stuff. Yeah, the, 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 I think the, the claustrophobia of that, yeah, um, I think, is uh, a theme that runs through the book. And, and some people, Higgy, for example, are comfortable with it, probably because they've never known anything else. And, and it's a, you know, maybe it is a comfort blanket for Higgy, but it's always, you know, maybe because, you know, Raymond's not, um, uh, not Raymond, sorry, maybe Danny knows that some of the things that he's been involved in in the past or the way that he's spoken to people are, you know, aren't right, then in a claustrophobic environment, there's, there's little getting away from that, you know. Um, and everything everything feels small, you know. The house that he's living in feels small. The house that he's, that Libby lives in, his mum, feels small. There's tiny cul-de-sacs, you know. Um, there's only the church and the pub right in the centre of town, opposite the road from each other. Um, and you can walk from the bridge to uh, the football club in, in about 15, 20 minutes. And it's, you know, there, there's that, I think, setting it in 1996 as well, there, there was almost like that sense of Barshaw is a village that the rest of the UK is left behind. You know, there's the wee story at the beginning about uh, the metaphor of building the bypass. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, in order that uh, and and some of the the villagers uh, campaigning for that because cars trundling through the villages to get to whether they're going to Dumfries or whether they're going down the A seventy six or something like that. Um, then they get what they want and someone builds a bypass around it and the town slowly dies because nobody comes there anymore and nobody, you know. Um, yeah, in the background in 1996, you've got the emergence of the Blair government and a, a kind of hopefulness that the country felt, you know, whether, whether it was through the music or the government or a change or just, you know, there was that palpable sense that all oh, things are going to get better now, you know. Yeah. Um, but in certain yeah. parts of the of the UK, Cool Britannia was as far away as as. Oh, absolutely. Aye. Yeah, well, that's what I thought about it, and it was interesting. You've got a playlist on the at the back of the book, songs for Nancy. Um, yeah. I guess you just loved doing those kind of things <laughs> put <them> together. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm aware of the fact that you know people will look at that and think that you know the book starts with a playlist and then the writing comes after that. It, it didn't this time. Um, but I do like um, I, I do like the books feeling like they're a wee bit kind of immersive, you know, and there, there, there are threads of things to, to follow. I mean, maybe just because that's the kind of books I like, you know, I, I, I like maybe books in writing that have connections to other things and take you in different directions, you know. Um, so I, I, I probably when we started talking about books and things like that, we'd be way back when the early ones. Yeah. I, I sometimes felt the constant need to apologise for bunging in songs that I liked into a playlist at the end. I don't, I don't need to bother about that anymore. Anyway. No, you do not. But what it, how it works really interestingly is a, a really good reminder of when the book's set. Because yeah. there isn't the big kind of, um, you know, news story or what some people might have done to kind of set it. And actually yeah. you go, oh yeah, that's the, the, it's just, it's a really, and also it's, I presume it's a cassette, is it? CDs. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, he, he gives, um, he makes, Danny makes this gift. Yeah, gift of course, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, and the, that's, that's effectively what was on it. And, you know, he's, he's um, that sense of spending, not having any real friends of his own, you know, spending time with, uh, you know, people like Morrissey and Marr and Nick Cave and, you know, um, and I think maybe at the age he's at, still hasn't probably grown out of that uh, period of being completely invested in what these lyrics mean and how they how they relate to. I think particularly the Smiths, you know. I um, mean, I felt like that. Oh, I was a lot younger than twenty nine, uh -huh. but it, it, it was it was intended to try and indicate that, in some respects, Danny hasn't progressed past that yet. You know, um, it, whilst from a narration point of view, he might seem quite articulate. I think when it comes to emotions and feelings, then he'll um, he'll reach for a song lyric uh, or a song more than being able to actually tell people what he thinks. Aye, more than coming up with his own feelings yeah. that he'll use there. Yeah. Uh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> and then, you know, the, I think music's a good device for that. Yeah. Uh, and it, it does, I suppose, hark back a wee bit to maybe the tail end of the mixtape, you know. That's what I was thinking. I was still making cassettes regularly at that time, you know, for getting yeah. out of work and playing them in my work or whatever. So yeah, no, I, I, I did I do like that, I think. And I you know, maybe all the books I write I'll have to have some a playlist listed at the end. It's just a question. <laughs> it's a question of not making them feel sure I'm done, you know. And um, you mentioned earlier about uh how some people thought you maybe started with a playlist and the book came from that. But how do you start uh, with your books? Um, do you think about the themes, whether it be mental health or uh, whatever, um, you know, in the heady heights, it was um, abuse of power. For yeah. people. Do you start with a kind of theme and then the characters come in or have you got a kind of character that you want to write about? Um, they, they've, that, this, is, this is the first one I've, I've uh, I've taken a different approach with, right? Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute because I think um, there's probably a reason or an influence for that. Um, but the the other ones um, have all been 
and and I suppose going back to uh, from from the first one, last days of disco was fairly heavily plotted. Um, okay, I was I would you know by admission drawing far more on my own life then you know um, and events that I, I was aware of, um, so that probably needed it less. But I still felt when, when I'd never done this before, and you know this is a new thing for me. Um, I, I I felt it it all had to be kind of plotted, and it was maybe a wee bit like um, doing a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and having to have all the borders right. done, and yeah. then you start to fill it in from that point of view. So you know the story arc and the timeline, and I kind of knew what was going to happen. And I I spent a lot of time uh, writing into A five black diaries. You know what what happens in this chapter? How do I get from this chapter to the next chapter? And what the structure of all that is? You know, um, uh, but as I, I think as I've gone on. I've kind of dropped that a bit more, albeit there's, there still has been um, a kind of basic structure or timeline there. Hedy Heights was the only one that, um, up to Danny Garvey actually, but Hedy Heights was one where I was probably about 50,000, 60,000 words into a draft with no idea of how it was going to end, you know. Um, and I spent but I was enjoying it so much. I was just enjoying that process of keeping on writing and then I would have another idea and then I thought, right, okay, that's that's taking it in that direction. And then eventually um, I kind of thought, um, and I read, you know, I, I, I do reach for influences a lot. Um, Rod, Roddy Doyle's The Van yeah. has a big input into, well, sort of all of my books, to be honest, but I think particularly this one where... Um, when all said and done, you know, I thought, what is this book about? It's really about middle-aged friendship, you know, um, and the central part of it was uh, Archie and uh, George and um, that's terrible. I've forgotten the name of my own characters here. The three of them at the end with the the van or the fish and chip shop and, you know, oh, yeah. and it, it kind of came to me that, right, that's how I'd like this to end, that despite everything, despite all the threats, despite all the feeling that they were going to be murdered or whatever, um, it comes down to three guys sitting on a park bench thinking, fucking hell, what happened there? Yeah. And then, the, you know, they, they've reconnected yeah. in a way. Um, Danny Garvey was different. Um, I um, I don't know whether I mentioned this to you, but um, last 2019, I went over to Germany on a, on a short tour with David Keenan. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were doing uh, a few, I think it was three gigs originally planned and it ended up being two, um, but we're moving around uh, there. And um, I mean, I've known him for a, for a while and we've done other things together, but I'd, I'd never spent a, 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 that kind of concerted period of time with him, you know? Um, and not only when we were doing the gigs, just listening to him, I mean, he's, you, you know, I mean, he's, Kind of mesmerising to listen to, and this whole thing about the rhythm of the 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 piece and the lack of you know the, mm -hmm. the structure is everything. And he said to me one time, I think I, I think something that he said a lot before, you know, I don't give a fuck about your story, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to make a political point, go and write an article on something. Yeah. And it really struck home with me that um, why don't I just sit down with an idea about human frailty and this character and a wee bit of this background and see where it goes, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it was, um, I think in equal parts, liberating, quite exhilarating, but really frightening as well, you know? Cause I, I, I thought, um, you know, it's, I don't know what Karen, my publisher's gonna feel about this. Um, I would didn't really want it to have chapters. I'd rather it had parts, you know, yep. a whole load of things that, that, that were probably different from what I had done before. Um, single, less less characters, there's, there's only a few. And yep. so that that claustrophobia thing would start to build in a single point narrative, you know. Um, 
and I, yeah, I mean, it, it, that this is the first time I've had no idea where it was going, other than the timeline of a of a season. If it gone more than a season, it would just have bored people. But I think that you, using the football metaphor as a as a as a uh, a timeline through seasons where you feel maybe differently about things in spring, and then you go through winter, and then you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you know what I mean? It's it's that um, it seemed like the perfect metaphor for how you examine someone's frailty and and their movement through that. You know, it's interesting. I wonder um, if you feel it would have been a different book, maybe clearly. But if you'd done it the other way, would you have? The, we won't see what the ending is, but would you have had the ending that you had, or do you think it was a kind of process of going right? Here's a blank page. We've got this character got maybe some things I want to write about and let's see where it takes me. Is it that kind yeah. of Yeah, my, my worry, Alistair, there, I think, is my, I'm, I'm going to say my natural optimism, you know, would have turned this into uh, a cup final win and people getting carried off shoulder high and, you know... Uh, a shot at glory. Aye, aye. Um, and I, I think um, it, it wasn't, what I wanted to do, you know, and I, yeah. I, I think it was better to invest more in the character and understand the character more and then see how, you know, how he navigated his way through this season, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I, had a, I had a brilliant editor as well. Well, I've got a brilliant editor. I, I think uh, Wes Camels edited all my books, you know. Um, but it was good for me probably that, he doesn't like football, and I don't yeah. think he would mind me saying that. So I I had to really play to him initially, I think, uh, and make sure it was a book that he was invested in. Uh, so that that was really good for me. I think it, it helped it helped me keep away from uh, probably my previously more natural attempts to fall into not not necessarily slapstick, but you know the natural absurdity of football you know um yeah no, absolutely so that you know that's, that's probably um there's probably not that much uh action on the football field but where it where it appears i think it's really important you know yeah and it's well, more yeah. it's, it's, it's more as an insight into danny's positioning point of, of point of view at that time as well i think yeah absolutely it gives uh insight into Danny, but it also gives insight into masculine interaction, for want of a better yeah. term. You know, men talking to other men, how they do it, the kind of, you see, not taking it seriously. Sport, particularly football, I think, allows people almost to um, vent their feelings without them actually venting their feelings or at least admitting to them. Yeah. And yeah. that comes across as a really strong aspect of the book. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's just... The irrationality of football, I think, is um, is great. It's, it's, as I say, it's one of the things I like most about it, to be honest, uh, that people can just lose themselves in this kind of uh, tribal... I, I don't mean tribal in terms of... I mean, obviously, it sometimes spills into the, the kind of... the negative connotations of what tribal actually means, but yeah. I think it's that whole thing about uh, loyalty and, and defending your club and your players in a way that you know if you stripped all that back um and and just placed these incidents in the context of everyday life people probably act differently you know yeah. um i mean my worry i, I suppose when, when if we're talking generally the worry is that politics has gone the same way you know that there does uh, you know there, there's no um analysis i don't think of uh opinions and you know it, it, it either falls into a, ca a category of well if that supports my political party or football team then I'm almost duty bound to defend it you know um, yeah. and sometimes you get people then in a, in a situation where they're almost defending the indefensible and they're trying to concoct arguments that you know the what the, the whole what about element you know yeah. or just for the sake of it you know um, it's funny in some respects, but I, I think it's it's also a wee bit worrying as well. And yeah. that I, I don't I don't know whether that I don't know whether that's a typically male thing. I suppose it's typically male in terms of the way it plays it out and things like football, you know. 
Um, but you can kind of see it creeping into other parts of life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like for or against, and there's no, nothing in between. Yeah, there, there's there's no um, there's no there's no space for rational discourse and and sort of listening to people's perspective and and you know disagreeing with it, but respectfully. Um, well, okay, you know, um, how, how do you know if you're right or I'm right or whatever? Um, and again, you know, I, and maybe that's the thing where football becomes a wee bit of a metaphor for different things on that on that front, you know. Not all good, I have to say. So you've covered um, Scottish football. Are you going to set one in Scottish politics? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, not not directly in politics. The, the thing I started just before... There's a couple of things I've got on the go at the minute, and right. one of them is um, one of them's about independence, um, and it's it's a it's about personal independence, but the 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 context of this is this Scottish independence uh, vote, you know, um, and it's it's uh, it starts off. It's another book that kind of spans a couple of generations, but it starts off. Uh, in a place called Humble uh, in Texas, right, um, and then you know moves to moves through different parts of America, San Francisco, and then to New York, and then um, there's a kind of connection of different characters in, in Glasgow in 2014 uh, with the American here to cover part of that story. Right. But um, there's been uh, of the briefest of connections between uh, her and um, a young group of guys who were touring in uh, 1983 in America. Um, and it's a wee bit like, I, I kind of like this idea of it being a, 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 an uh, unrequited love story right. uh, and nostalgia for things that, you know, for things that people have lost. But the independence element is about, you know, if, if you make yourself truly independent, do you then start to build barriers around yourself, you know, from a personal point of view that doesn't let anybody in? So I think it's a wee bit of a reflection from people who um, are alone at the time that they meet up and they're talking about independence um, from a political point of view, but reflecting on decisions and things that they've done in their life before that have maybe caused them to be, you know, um, maybe the, the the physical independence that they craved at the time isn't necessarily what they would look back and and um, you know with any kind of love or maybe wish they'd done something different in the past. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, so there there would have to be some political observations within that. I would think. <laughs> hey, that sounds like it might be quite far down the line. Is that definitely? Because I would love to read that. That sounds a cracking book. Well, yeah. I mean. It, it, it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange one actually. Um, it's it's called low expectations, um, and it had its origins in a film script. Uh, it was based on uh, based on a story idea that um, someone gave me, uh, and I kind of tried to think about this in terms of a script. Um, but actually, it's one of those things that. So that, again, in, in complete contrast to what I told you about Danny Garvey, there is a structure here and there is, um, but to make it uh, work as a novel, it needs different direction and it needs different focus and different, but I'm interested in the story because I think the story hangs together really well. And it's, there's this kind of transatlantic contrast between not only individuals and people, but how um, you know a culture operates at, at three different times in people's lives, you know, and where the connections uh, between them are, you know, and I quite like that. I, I just I, I like the the idea of examining a whole load of different things through uh, two two metaphors or two people who are you know, um, going through different things at different times in their life, you know. Um, the other one that I, I started to work on was an, just an idea. I mean, this is one that hasn't gone anywhere else, but um, the more I think about it, the more it feels like a, a play. Um, right. I can't imagine people are rushing to put plays out at the minute. 
<laughs> we know where he's showing them, but it was about four uh, four women who had been uh, around about 40 years old age. Three of them had been friends since school. Right. And another one has been friends with them for less time. Um, but they meet up every weekend. Uh, and that's the only time they see each other, you know. Uh, and they're planning a, a weekend away uh, overseas somewhere. And right. the, the kind of discussion and action all takes place in this uh, dining, uh, this uh, restaurant that they meet. And part of it is narrated by um, a, a waitress, a receptionist, kind of someone who does basically everything, but who's come to know them because they're always there at the same time. They've always got the same table. They know her. They've started to understand a wee bit more about her background. Right. Um, and as the conversation develops between them, you kind of realise that they've got secrets from each other and that cast iron friendship that you would have thought has been built on for 30 odd years is kind of pretty crumbly once you start yeah. to pack away at it you know um a quick uh, that idea is something it's called weekenders um, right. as opposed to eastenders <laughs> sounds, sounds good as well um are, so th how close are you to i mean you, you how can you say you, this is just out but uh you've always seemed to be working on the next thing don't you i mean you've that's yeah to I, I think probably um I have to say I'm struggling a wee bit at the minute with motivation for right. it. You know, uh, I'm not massively worried about the low expectations one because, as I say, I think I've I, I know where that's going. Right. It's just, I don't know about everybody else, but um, I think this period of lockdown and closure I've found much much harder than yeah, any other too. point. Um, I mean, it's almost like the whole the whole thing from the beginning of March last year. Um, I, I could easily divide into three phases for me, you know, and I, you know, almost they don't even sort of glide into each other. They're almost kind of cut off. The first one um, was, I mean, I, I, I was working as the architect over at uh, Louisa Jordan. So that first four weeks of lockdown, when it was an absolute lockdown, yeah. was weird for me because I was still going to work. You know, I was still. Yeah, I was going to a different place from my normal work, but I was still getting in the car every morning up, you know. Yeah. Um, and, I've, and no one else at that time, I was unaware that anybody else was leaving the house for anything more than half an hour or an hour, you know. Um, and then you come out of that and you start to go into the summer and I started to feel, this is actually all right. I, I, I quite like bits of this. I'm yeah. seeing my family, you know. Uh, I don't have to drive the M77. Um, flexibility of working. We, the office was doing really well at that point, yeah. um, and I thought, you know, this is this is okay. And then you start to go into late November and December, and everything starts to close in again, and through Christmas, and you know, that dawning realization that you not only could twenty twenty be a bit of a write off, twenty twenty one looks like it's maybe gonna go the same way. Yeah. And I found I have to say, you maybe the same, I found that really, really difficult, you know, yeah. um to focus or concentrate on anything, whether it was reading or writing or anything other than just watching shit on TV that would make me feel a wee bit better, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think the first time it was, there was almost a sense of uh, novelty about it. Oh, we're all being told to stay at home. Oh, yeah. well, like, what can we do? But, you know, if you remember, it was like, well, we're we'll back in the pubs by the end of April or something mental. Yeah. Yeah. And now, it, as you say, it's this thing like, well, not only are we locked down again, but this could go on for who knows how long. Yeah. Uh, it's just really tough for everyone. Oh, I know, um, and it, and it's you know, but even even the most optimistic and forward looking of us, it's really tough. And I mean, and I, and I uh, first to hold my hand up, um, you know, I God only knows what it must be like for people with young kids or mm -hmm. kids that haven't home school. Um, yep. You know that that must they must have the patience of a saint. You know, it, it must be. I'm past that now. Um, and I feel it for my own kids, I have to say, you know, like in terms of 
their options and choices and things like that being closed down. But we're far from, you know, um, I mean, a fairly privileged and, and uh, happy position. Um, so as I say, I, you know, I think there's also an element of guilt that for me feel, I shouldn't be feeling like this, you know? Yeah. Uh, and what I've, you know, that, that kind of whole thing about, well, what have I got to complain about? So it's tough. I mean, you're, you're kind of constantly trying to remind yourself of that and then having to compartmentalise everything else. Um, but yeah, it's... Well, hopefully we will eventually be able to get out and meet up again and hopefully... Um... I, oh, no doubt, no yes. doubt. I've got a few, th I mean, I've got a few things that, um, you know, you park away and you think, right, that's... I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, one of them, I, I, uh, Jenny Fagan's book, Blocking Booth. Just finished uh, it uh, last night, it's fantastic. Well, I, I, I had, I'm sitting there thinking I could order that or I could, and I thought um, I'd mentioned to her, would she sign a book and leave it for me in the bookshop through the Port Portobello bookshop, um, who are doing some signed books for me for orders. Um, so I thought I'm going to, I'm not going to order it from them. I would, I would rather leave that to the point where I can drive and go into the shop and that would that would be the first book I think that um, I would buy by handing over some cash or a card to somebody and walking out of the shop you know, with a book in my hand, you know? Yeah. And I, I, there's a wee bit of a feeling that uh, when I can do that, we'll maybe have turned a wee bit of a corner, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Just even a trip to Edinburgh would be something. For a and, and for a glass region to admit that as well. I know, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm missing it. Well, David, thanks for talking to us. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up. And you, mate. And you. And uh, we'll be back soon with somebody completely different. Cheers. Yeah.